Remember Kevin Malone from The Office? The sitcom character once said, I work hard all day. I like knowing that there's going to be a break. Most days, I just sit and wait for the break. I laughed when Kevin said it, but for the Christian, work and our attitude toward it is to be something different. Sadly, most of us don't know what that something different is. Too many of our kids are growing up without a working theology of vocation, calling, and work. And if we want to see our kids liberated from the cultural narrative of seeing work as a necessary evil, we need to educate them properly. Stick with us as I have a paradigm-shifting chat with Dan Doriani about his new book, Work That Makes a Difference, on this episode of Youth Culture Matters. From the Center for Parent Youth Understanding, this is Youth Culture Matters. If you're a parent, youth worker, educator, counselor, grandparent, or anyone else who cares about kids, we're glad you've joined us for this practical, informative, and hope-filled podcast. This is a place where together we talk and think Christianly about the rapidly changing world of today's children, teens, and young adults. Well, another episode of Youth Culture Matters, and I am very excited to have a conversation today about an issue that I think many times in the church and certainly in our homes and youth ministries, we don't talk about with any sort of depth or insight, but it's so much a part of our world, and that is our work. I was doing a little math today, and I was thinking that if, you know, we work eight hours a week for uh, 52 weeks a year, and we work, let's say, for 45 years. If I did the math right, Chris will check me on this, 93,600 hours of work. I mean, we spend, I, I do the math too with sleeping, and we've done math recently with how much time kids are spending on screens. And when we see large numbers like that, that's always an indicator that if we truly believe that Jesus is the Lord of all of life and sovereign over all things, God has something to say Jesus has something to say. The scriptures have something to say, obviously, about work. And I think many of us miss that. And missing that is is just, it's a huge blunder. Uh, because, as you see, as we chat through this, this topic today, we miss so much about the beauty of work and the theology of work. And that's where we're going to go with this. And I'm glad that parents and youth workers are joining us. I want you to stick with us because we have a guest who's going to help unpack this and who has written a wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, I'll introduce you to him in just a couple of minutes, but certainly a book that you can you can uh, teach from. So, Chris, I, I wanted to ask you as I was thinking about this. You know, you and I have talked in the past about some of our crazy jobs that we've had, and you you actually just told me you've had over the course of your life forty, you know, plus years. How many jobs? Uh, I've had over twenty jobs. Twenty different jobs, and, and that's and I want to be clear i've worked at cpyu for over 18 years so it's not like i'm like job hopping uh, on a regular basis or yeah anything like yeah that. just we're yeah. getting fired yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> no i i've just held a lot of odd jobs here on the side now and then and especially through high school and college yeah, but yeah. yeah well let it be known that uh i never want you to have 21 jobs so <laughs> we'll just say that publicly we love having you here so uh what were your first three jobs i love asking questions like this because people have weird things in their background that they've done the first three i had a my very first paid job was a paper route okay um but it was not one of those like kid on a bike you know 30 houses or whatever this was if i recall it was 850 uh homes on the route so this was literally fill up the entire back of the family minivan yeah, it was your with dad's newspapers route. and yet yeah, uh and i think I think my dad ended up having to replace the brakes <laughs> on the vehicle eventually. So I'm not sure it ended up uh, working out, but uh, he didn't make me pay for that. It, so that that's that a job out. most people don't aren't even aware even exists anymore if it sure. does exist. So yeah. what, what, two more. What were your uh, yeah, then I had a couple different uh, – I worked in a lot of different restaurant jobs. So I was a, a host and waiter at Big Boy restaurants with the, you know, the big guy oh, yeah. holding up the hamburger. And then I held a long-time job through most of high school and college uh, bussing tables at a restaurant called Max and Irma's. And right. I, to this day, I actually still really like bussing tables. I like clearing tables. It, I'm, I was good at it. I was efficient at it. Um, uh, yeah, I liked it. Yeah, that just confirms my my longstanding 
notions of you as being an oddball. So that's good. I love that. You, Very that's true. A, that's a skill I didn't know that you had, nor did I know that you enjoyed that. So, yeah, I was thinking, I, I wrote down some things. Beyond mowing grass, uh, you know, for others when I was younger, first job was pot washer in a bakery. And then I moved very quickly to work at a lawn and garden center in the lawnmower repair shop with the one mm. proprietor. It was kind of fun, you know, doing that and learning learning that. That was that was a great skill to learn. And then um, my last job before heading off to college was working on a blacktop crew. And I'll tell you, I learned a lot about work and how people view work there because when the boss wasn't around, the other guys on the crew who were longstanding, some two, three, four decades on this crew, would tell me to slow down. The boss isn't here. And that that taught me a lot about the way that, that some people decide to work. So, yeah, the first three jobs would be fun to hear from others about that. So we're going to talk about work today with Dan Doriani, who is someone I've known for a long time. Uh, I first met Dan, I think he was a senior at Geneva College in 1974, 75. I don't know, is that correct? Did you graduate in 75? 75, yeah. yeah. So um, he was, and he was, we we took uh, required Bible classes, and I remember going to class two days a week, and then we'd have one day of Bible discussion. Dan was my Bible discussion leader. So I, I, it's funny, we, have, we had Bible and humanities, so now I've got my Bible discussion leader on here, and we've had Steve Garber on. Steve was my humanities discussion leader, so it's kind of fun to reconnect this way. And, and Dan has gone on, he's now a professor of biblical and systematic theology at Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis. He's been a pastor, he's a, a prolific writer, we're going to include links to all of his books. And in addition to that, what's really uh, notable for today is Dan's the founder of the Center for Faith and Work in St. Louis, which is a discipleship uh, ministry to folks who are, are working, and we're going to talk a lot about that. And he also has a podcast that presently, the title of the podcast is Simply Working with Dan Doriani. So, Dan, welcome. It's, it's so good to have you here. And it's great to be here and good to chat with you again, Walt. I'm just going to go ahead and say I, I do remember you from that discussion group, and I remember you as a talented guy. You know, all all leaders are talent scouts, and you notice. And so I noticed right away that you were a very intelligent and thoughtful guy. I was not surprised that you lead a significant ministry. Well, I'm going to thanks for saying that. I'm going to tell you it's surprising <laughs> it's surprising to me that you noticed that. We had uh, one of our last podcasts, we had one of your colleagues, Phil Douglas on here. And Phil was my first youth pastor when I was in ninth grade. And we asked Phil about, you know, what he remembers about me back then and he says, "Walt was a very quiet guy." And I was stunned by that. I mean, I just don't ever. I, it was stunning to my wife as well. But you it, overcame it. Yeah, I probably did. Either that, or just, I don't know what happened. But yeah, thanks for saying that. So, Dan, I you know, what I want to start with this question because on this podcast we talk about uh, youth culture and the kinds of of trends that are out there. And certainly, we've heard in this COVID world, we've heard a lot about work you know, the way we've changed our work, the way we've changed our, our places where we work, people leaving jobs, unemployment rates being through the roof, all these different things that are out there uh, that are changes that have been, you know, sparked by COVID. And I, I you know, people, so people are thinking about work. Obviously, we think about it because we do it. And whether we're thinking about it consciously or unconsciously, we all have some kind of worldview about work, and I want to ask you from where you sit uh, and all of your thinking over the years about work. Give us give us some insight into the cultural narrative, and and I want you to do this because the cultural narrative on work, because many of us lean into this without even knowing it, and it's not until somebody brings it up and says, "Hey, here's what the culture is telling us about work, the value of work, the meaning of work, the kinds of work." Uh, you know, that we should seek to engage in, you know, from where you sit, what, what are, what is the cultural narrative that we need to be aware of? Yeah. So great question. Thanks, Walt. Uh, there's a number of narratives. Uh, so the first one would be something like work is a burden, mm. um, an onerous burden that should be shed as rapidly as possible. In the past, they would give it to animals or slaves. This is Greek thought, Greco-Roman thought. 
uh, today we give it to machines as much as we possibly can. It keeps us from the good, the meaningful life. But the other, uh, maybe you could say at the other extreme, the Marxist influence is that work is something we have to do in order to survive. And those who have power pay as little as they possibly can to extract the labor and uh, gain wealth at the expense of those who are relatively powerless. That's, that narrative certainly around that everybody thinks of themselves as oppressed unless they push back pretty hard. Mm-hmm. And then the reaction to that, of course, is uh, capitalism or Adam Smith. I'm not against capitalism, just to make that clear, but Adam Smith would say, uh, well, what we need to do is increase productivity and people will endure the misery, the drudgery of work because they have more food, clothing, shelter, leisure, pleasures. And if you just pay people enough, then they won't mind bad work, which, you know, there's different sides of Adam Smith, but that's definitely a feature of, of uh, Wealth of Nations, which I reread from my books on work. Um, so those are, you know, the big anchors uh, to burden, get rid of it, exploit other people, push back. And, and if you just give people enough money, they'll put up with anything. Yeah. And, and then the, another reaction to that says, no, no, false, false. Um, what people really want is meaning in their work and they will endure hard work for meaning. And there are various people who said that over the years and will, in, um, will actually find themselves in their work if they find good work. So then there's a sort of the uh, existential approach, which is, you know, do something that's uh, life giving, even if you receive less in life. So those are the big intellectual anchors. And then at a much more popular level, there's, um, you know, these are all showing up in, in their own form today. So one form is, you know, work a little bit, work as little as you can to make as much money as you can as fast as you can, which is certainly out there. It's what's, um, I find, you know, it's, uh, I found more and more uh, people in their 20s and 30s <clears throat> who are not actually all that interested in power or a lot of money. What they really want is a good enough income give them enough leisure to enjoy life and to have some of the stuff they really care about. So ideally, I don't, I don't want to work hundred, you know, 90 hours a week to make 250,000. I'll work. What I really want is a job. They'll say that I can put in 28 or 32 hours and nobody cares as long as I'm getting my job done. And then I make 70,000 because we've got some rare skills and I can go kayaking and, and rock climbing on weekends. Yeah. That's very common right now it's a goal a lot of people have in college and beyond um and then you know i don't know if, how much uh, you know you want me to keep going i'll give you one more and that is you know if work is a burden and nothing else the greek view that probably stands behind the great resignation that we're seeing right now uh, because people are realizing i actually don't need money right now i have enough savings i can, can go on uh you know obamacare if you don't mind the term for that and uh you know, there's always a job out there. I'm, I'm working for $13 an hour. If I wait three weeks, I'll earn $14 an hour or $16 an hour because of, of the shortage of laborers we have right now. So naturally, the price of workers has been has been increasing. So nobody, I don't think anybody's fully fathomed exactly what's happening with the great resignation, but I think it's a consequence of viewing work as a burden that you endure simply to fund your life, food, yeah. clothing, shelter. Yeah, just a couple of things I'll I'll mention here. And by the way, I want to mention, you know, right out of the gate, I should have said this right out of the gate, um, that Dan's latest book is called Work That Makes a Difference. And I'm really excited about this because the kinds of things that he's talking about here with us, just as he lays out the cultural narrative, he goes on in that book and talks about a different way to view work in a way that we view work Christianly, you know, rooted in in God's truth and uh, the scriptures. So, uh, we're going to come back to that. I, I just want to say something about the Great Resignation. It's it's good you brought that up because, you know, that's a, a term that's been coined during COVID here. And I, I looked up a little bit about this and, and found that uh, the data from April to June of this year, and we're recording in 2021, the second quarter, uh, said that 11.5 million Americans quit their jobs during that quarter. 8.4 million Americans during that quarter were jobless. And which is interesting because maybe maybe some of those went obviously the 11.5 went to other jobs, but we have 8.4 million Americans who are jobless, unemployed, and 10.9 million job openings, mm-hmm. and and I think you know like we 
we watched everything shut down here where we live in central Pennsylvania. I'm thinking of one particular establishment, Harvey's Barbecue, which is near us. And, uh, you know, I was waiting for that place to open. They were just doing drive through And a year into COVID, I still I think they're still doing drive through But I went through there and I, I said to the proprietors, we picked up some food. I said, hey, when are you going to open up back, you know, in the in the you know, open up in the dining room. And, and the proprietor said, when we can get people to work, you know, people are just not willing to work. And I saw in our local McDonald's, I don't know if you saw this, Chris, the other day, I think it was $17 an hour. They're hiring, uh, you know, as a, as a start uh, to start, which is, which is amazing to me. So what you're saying then, Dan, is that, you know, functionally we, we maybe work because we have to or work, work enough to get what we want. And I, I think it's interesting what you said about younger folks because, again, there, I, I believe there's a, a pushback against the prior generation and what they thought were, what was craziness, all that, you know, working to accumulate. But they're, they're still working in some ways to accumulate just enough to have the kind of lifestyle that they want. And what I'm, I'm thinking is, you know, functionally, with everything you described there, I guess that most people in our culture, would this be fair to say, view work more negatively or maybe at the very least neutrally, in a neutral way, not in a positive way, and some see it as a necessary evil? Uh, no question. A lot of people see it as a necessary evil. Um, so one thing, I'll just go back and say something about my book, if I may. Yes. The book that you're referencing, it came out in July, is for study groups and for use in churches with lots of discussion groups. A couple of years earlier, I wrote a book called Work, It's Unity, Dignity, and Transformation. That's a little heavier, you might say. It might work for, a, for the leader of a Bible study for more information. Uh, but I did about kind of close to 500 interviews for those two books, and the most common question I asked, not the only one by any means, was, do you enjoy your work, yes or no? And if you do, tell me why. What I was amazed uh, by is that most people said they enjoy their work. And when they said, <clears throat> I enjoy my work, why? The most common answer was a heavy, heavy plurality, not the majority answer, but a heavy plurality was, it started with my boss. My boss cares about me. My boss loves me. My boss gives me opportunities. My boss makes sure I have a good work environment. Or even, you know, I'm going to ask people in very ordinary jobs, like at my gym, handing out towels. Why do you, you like working here? It's a very happy place to work, I have to say. And they would say, well, you know, my boss, the boss creates a good schedule for us and doesn't push us to work seven days a week. And is very mindful of, of uh, the fact that our pay is relatively low and we're not, you know, uh, we shouldn't be pushed around. And so it's great. Mm. We're treated with dignity. So I was amazed at how many people said they liked their work because they actually don't always act like they like their work. <laughs> so maybe that was the right answer that they, they felt it was the right thing to say, yes, I like my work. Um, so that's a conundrum. I'm not sure I've, I've uh, come to the bottom of that one. But people definitely don't want to work any more than they have to, unless they believe in the cause. And then you have people go the other direction. And Walt, you, you may be like this. Certainly, I can be. I can be like this. Uh, I care about my cause too much, and have some other personal problems um, as well, that are, are follies, is what I mean, that make me work too many hours, and you know, not sleep enough, and not take enough time to pause and reflect. Mm. That's good. That's really good. Well, we're, we're going to take a break here, and when we come back, we've heard a little bit now about the cultural narrative as we've talked to Dan Doriani, and, and we're going to talk more about the biblical narrative. You know, how do we correct this? Because I don't want my grandkids. I don't want my kids. I don't want the students that youth workers are, are working with and that other parents are raising to grow up leaning into the cultural narrative if it's it's one that, uh, of drudgery at some level or a motivation to work for the wrong reasons. So we're going to hear how God's order and design resets this, reboots this, changes this, and gives, as Dan's book title says, you know, uh, gives work uh, something that is meaningful and makes a difference. So we'll be right back and continue our conversation. Stick with us.
If you enjoy listening to Youth Culture Matters and would like to support the ongoing efforts of this ministry, you can do so by visiting cpyu.org slash giving to make a donation. Your prayers and financial support make this podcast possible. So as we got ready to talk about work today on the podcast with Dan Doriani, author of Work That Makes a Difference, a new book that we highly recommend, I did some searching around and just just Googled, you know, songs, pop music songs that speak about work. And I went back to this one that I remember from when I was 9, 10, 11 years old. Always heard it on AM radio. Never had the, the record, the 45, but the Vogue's. Five o'clock world. I it, listen to these lyrics: trading my time for the pay I get, living on money that I ain't made yet. Got to keep going. Got to make my way. But I live for the end of the day, because it's a five o'clock world. When the whistle blows, no one owns a piece of my time. And as we were talking with Dan about some of the ways that we look at work and functionally work and live to work. Uh, Man, that's it. That's a cultural narrative there in so so many ways. Uh, Dan, before we get into the the biblical narrative, would you would you just define work? You know, tell us what we're talking about here right. when you say work. What what do we what do we mean? Yeah, so work is a little bit different from an effort, and it's certainly different from a paycheck. It's very important to recognize that work is probably well defined as concentrated effort to accomplish a goal. That's a short, dirty definition, but it, it's Pretty, pretty widely accepted. And the value of that one is it distinguishes uh, between work that is uh, remunerated and work that isn't, and also carelessness. So a student works by studying. You don't get paid to study, but that's your job. Uh, for that matter, a student who's an athlete gets concentrated effort in a task. It's, if you make a team, you're not paid for it. Um, unless you become a professional, but it's still work because you're giving your best. It's concentrated effort, ordinarily, ideally with a skill and a training. Moms who stay at home, dads who stay at home and take care of kids are working. And uh, retired people certainly can and should work, not dabble at volunteering a little bit here and there, but actually get good. So uh, St. Louis, where I live, has a lot of refugees, for example. And you can kind of fiddle with it and say, oh, I help refugees. Or you can actually learn a thing or two about the refugee life and get in there and get good at it and help them find a job, make their way, uh, discern the best way to bridge the gap from their culture to American culture with proper acceptance and proper resistance. So work is concentrated effort to accomplish a task, ideally with skill and training. Okay. Uh, You know, since we're talking about definitions here, can you talk about, and I'm going to want to come back to this because we want to talk about how to help kids discern this, but, you know, uh, calling, vocation, sure. those are terms that I know you've used in the book as well. Right. So calling, of course, in the Bible has primarily a reference to God's call to believe in Christ. That's the main use of the word calling in the Bible. God summons us to himself above all. And then sometimes, you know, one out of ten maybe, God calls us to a task. So Paul was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles and uniquely equipped for that because, as you know, Walt, he was a, a master of both Greek, Greco-Roman and Jewish culture, and he probably knew Aramaic and Hebrew and Greek and maybe some other dialects and was very well trained, could quote the rabbis, could quote the Bible, and could quote Greek philosophers. So he was equipped for a particular call. Moses was called to lead the people out of Egypt Joshua called to lead the people into the promised land, David to create peace in the nation of Israel, Solomon to build the temple. Those were not interchangeable. They had particular calls. In a similar vein, you know, when you look at uh, the concept of calling the Bible, it makes it very clear that some people are good at teaching, leading, serving, uh, deeds of mercy, and so on. And the issue there is to kind of, when you're working with teens, let's say, or or college students, uh, the cultural narrative is, what do I want to do? What's my desire? What wells up within me? And of course, half of all boys want to be professional athletes and half of all girls want to be either singers or ballerinas. And it doesn't work out that way. So then what you have to do is ask what connection to your internal desires, what's the connection between your internal desires and what people actually want you to do 
and what people recognize you as being good at. And so I think I said this earlier, all leaders are talent scouts. Everybody's looking for skill sets. And some of them are manipulative. I want to find what I can extract from you. And others are caring. And they say, I see something in you. And I want you to know that I see that in you. And I want to help you develop it. And so you're given an opportunity to do something like, uh, let's say somebody thinks they're a musician, since we talked about the Vogues and the Beatles. Um, so would you, you're, you're, a, you're a pianist and a guitarist. Uh, can you sub in? One of our people is away this week. And you say, sure. And they say, hey, thanks. Uh, thanks, Walt. That was great. I appreciate you stepping in. We really appreciate your effort. And they never call you again. That means it didn't work out. It means you're not as good as you think you are. But if they say, hey, we're going to, you know, our penis is to be gone again in a month. Would you sub in again? Then that means there's a talent there. And ideally, they'll help you develop it. And, you know, they, oh, you can play the saxophone too? Oh, we wanted to add that. And so then there's a virtuous cycle of interest, recognition, experience, training, and deepening in passion, deepening in skill. And then vistas open up so that eventually you might find that, you know, your real calling is actually to be a sound engineer, mm. which you never would have thought of when you were first playing the guitar or the piano or the saxophone, but you have a great ear when something's wrong and that's extremely valuable. So another song about work, since you're talking about work is uh, Steely Dan. I don't recommend them as morally speaking, but they're great musicians. They had a song called, I don't want to do your dirty work no more. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I love, I love the, you know, these brilliant people and they're, their tagline is, oh, yeah. Anyway, I don't want to do your dirty work no more. Well, I mean, a lot of work looks like dirty work at first, but it's not. And Steely Dan's excellence, the reason why they're still played and esteemed is because they had an extraordinarily lean, clean sound, no distortions, no mess. Well, that's a sound engineer. And the sound engineer probably was a pretty good musician first. And so then they can distinguish good versus very good versus superb when you look at a take yeah and this whole process you're describing you know i I would see this as uh you know boy i don't know what we could what you know like we talk about chris with uh you know talking to talking to students and teaching students how to bring honor and glory to god through their use of technology and social media Mm -hmm. we call it digital discipleship i don't know is there a name for this dan that we call it vocational discipleship or you know Absolutely. Okay. Mentoring is what I like to yeah, still call it. Yeah. But and, discipleship, and that means you, um, look, if somebody asks you to do a job, it doesn't really count for much. If somebody asks you to do a job and they know you, and they give some tokens that they care about you, and they know the field, that's mo- that's meaningful. That's deeply meaningful. Yeah. So we, we always have to warn kids about uh, those who recognize a skill in order to throw them in the machine and take, you know, take what they can from them. You were talking about jobs earlier, you know, there's, we all, we all, you know, we, we all scrub pots or unload trucks or something like that. We're just part of the machine and we know that. And then we try to get out of that spot. Um, And ideally it's a person who loves us and cares about us and understands the way the world works and has some sense of how we might fit into it in a way that brings us joy and brings healing to the world. Yeah. And what you're describing here, I mean, this is a th- this is a task that youth workers need to be about. This is a task that parents need to be about, because if we don't have these conversations and if we aren't looking to realize uh, what kind of skills and, and gifts and abilities our, our students have, they're, they're going to fall into maybe we call it sort of the cookie cutter or the machine of how the world or the culture views vocation and calling and work and uh, not experience the richness that we're called to through the biblical narrative. And I want to ask you about that now because, mm-hmm. you know, the meat and potatoes of your, of your book, it, there's a great theology of, of work, of all these things that we're talking about in there. And this has, this has got to be, this is why I'm excited to chat with you, this has got to be a huge component of what we're doing in our homes with our kids and what we're doing with our students in our ministries, because we are serving to prepare them for 
uh, a life of giving honor and glory to God and work, you know, how we spend our time is a huge part of that. So talk about yeah. that. Yeah, sure. So the thing we need to say first, Walt, I know we agree on this, is that God had ordained work before the fall, mm. which means it's good, it's creation good. God himself is described with all kinds of terms about work. So I have, I have a book that I'm reading right now called Work and Worship by a guy named uh, Matthew Kamink. And he has one of the many who lists all the jobs God does in the Bible. You know, he's a potter, he's a shepherd, he's a gardener, he's a king. Uh, and so forth. So God's a worker. And Jesus, of course, was a carpenter. He worked with his hands. Paul worked with his hands, tent maker. But they also taught, so that, that's an endorsement of both blue collar and we could say white collar, work with your hands, work with your mind, work with, work with your tongue. So God's a worker and he tells us to work. God worked six days and he tells us to work six days. God rests, he tells us to rest. And then, of course, as you know, he says, uh, fill the earth and subdue it and exercise dominion over it. And that's taken pejoratively, like some people, you know, that, that in, inculcates exploitation. But it's more like um, Genesis 1, 2, subdue the earth, exercise dominion over it. And then Genesis 2 says, well, till the garden and care for it, tend it. And those are tender words. So we have these tender, caring kinds of words, like care for the garden, tend the garden. After it says, hey, you know, here are the rivers, and by the way, there's gold down in one river, like, you know, go find the gold and do something with it. And and there's, you know, precious stones. And just want you to know, I put these riches in the earth for you to develop. And I want you to exercise dominion because it's hard. Gold doesn't just leap out of the earth. And, you know, granite doesn't just say, here I am in a perfectly formed slab. You have to exercise force, strength to extract it. But you do it in a caring way. So you don't tear the tops off mountains, you don't pollute streams and so forth. And then of course, after the fall, work becomes uh, misery and toil and thorns and thistles and, and, uh, and insects, bugs and computer bugs, we, we call them today, interestingly. So uh, work is then fallen, but then work is also restored. And we see that probably best in Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus has that passage we talk about so much you know, come, you who are blessed of my father and, uh, you know, receive the reward. I'm just going to give you a couple verses here from it to make sure I have it right. So first of all, in Matthew 25, there's this blessing on the faithful worker, right? You had five talents, made five more, two talents, made two more. Well done, good and faithful servant. Quick note, the praise is absolutely identical, whether you made five out of five talents, five more out of five, or two out of two. So God doesn't ask everybody to produce tons of stuff. They ask you, God asks you to do what you can with what you have. And, you know, you may have more raw ability. You may have had more mentors. You may have had better parents. You may have had uh, been born in a better nation that allows you to be productive. And he praises you for doing what you can with what's in front of you. But uh, the other one, of course, is on the last day, the king will say, come, you who are blessed by, fa by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? Because I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You welcomed me. I was naked. You clothed me. Um, I was in prison and you came to me. And so what that does, that covers most of work, right? That's food. I was hungry. Water. I was thirsty. I was naked. That's clothing and shelter, we would say. And then prison is all the people in great need. So we could throw uh, people who have... Uh, physical problems, mental problems, isolation, and so forth. There's many ways to be imprisoned, right? And literal prison, yes, but other forms. And then a stranger is all the, you know, curing all the problems of human isolation and a separation from each other. And anytime you're in any of those spheres, which actually covers most of the economy, just in a quick way right there, anytime you're doing anything in any of those spheres for the sake of God and neighbor, the Lord sees it and is pleased. So you're not just earning money, you're loving your neighbor, you're loving God, honoring God, respecting God. It's also interesting, and I know <clears throat> Chris and Walt, you both know this, that the righteous will say, we don't remember doing this. When did we, you know, feed the hungry? And the truth of the matter is we don't think enough about when we're serving people. Um, and we think I'm just doing what the boss said, or, or I'm doing what I was told, or I'm, you know, sending out, I'm working the fast food and pushing the food out. But 
you have to remember that as you're pushing out the fast food, you're often answering the prayers of people. I don't know if you have the experience of driving across, you know, our vast nation out West and it's nine o'clock and oh my goodness, <laughs> the, the, the chances of getting food are diminishing rapidly. And you start praying, Lord, help the next. I know there's a Wendy's 40 miles away. Dear Lord, let it be open. And, you know, the person at Wendy's is just pushing the food out. And we're saying, praise God that I've got food uh, tonight. So we don't know. We don't know when we're serving people. If I may tell a story. Uh, when I was in fourth grade, I was possibly the naughtiest boy in my class. I was bored all the time and trying to get everybody to laugh all the time. And so I was put in a corner away from my friends, surrounded by good girls, put out in the hall. I was constantly told I wasn't living up to my potential. And my teacher gave me C's that I did not deserve, not that I was working hard, but I didn't deserve C's. And when I was in grad school working on my PhD, I wrote her a letter. And I said, um, her name was Bearer, B-E-R-E-R, B-E-A-R-E-R. -E -E and I said, dear Mrs. Barrett, just want you to know I'm working on my um, PhD now, and I was your student in fourth grade, and you made the life of a naughty boy miserable, and I'm writing to thank you for it, because I was always disrespectful, always trying to make people laugh, never paying attention. You made it so miserable that when I moved after fourth grade to a new school and was afraid to be naughty because I didn't know anybody, I accidentally got straight A's, and it felt so good after all the abuse you heaped on me in fourth grade. It felt so good to not be chastised and put in a corner and sent to the principal's office. I've kept it up ever since. And so I'm thanking you for making me miserable. And um, the sad truth is I got a letter back, I don't know, two, three <laughs> weeks, four weeks later. And it said, uh, dear Mr. Doriani, Mrs. Bearer would have been so glad to receive your letter. She died two months ago. Mm. So she never knew. But I'm she she <laughs> She was reading the Bible and praying before class when it had just become illegal. So I'm pretty sure she was a Christian and now she knows, Yeah. but you know, she was disciplining a bad boy and that probably felt just miserable to her, but she was changing my life without knowing it. And a lot of our work is seen to be beautiful and glorious only by God because we don't have eyes for it. So I, I have a daughter who's an architectural designer and you know, she's very good at what she does. She's won awards. I'm very proud of her. But sometimes she doesn't lift her eyes up. And I say, you're building buildings that could be in use for 200 years. It's a high-end construction firm she works for. And, you know, you're going to make a good workplace for people that will be great, 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 great grandchildren of somebody you know or somebody you don't know. The way you build that corridor, the way you that, that welcoming space or that grand hallway or whatever it is, can make a difference for 200 years. And when I say it, she says, oh, right, of course. But she doesn't think of it because it's just work, 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 work. And we have to see it as it is work. She does work hard, but it's also tilling the earth, subduing it, caring for it. And remember that God always knows it. We don't always know that as I build this space, which I'm enjoying building, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of eyes can take delight in this space that's well proportioned and perfect for gathering how, how would you how would you talk about this to someone perhaps a young person mm. who you know chris and i were talking about some of our early jobs which we would consider i mean they would be labeled right mundane work or mm -hmm you know, just stuff you got to do. I mean, I was working because I needed to make money to pay for college. And my parents right. said, you need to get a job. So I went out and I looked right. for a job. There are adults who would say, I've spent my whole life in mundane work. We, I, I've had conversations, Dan, with, with peers of, of ours from Geneva who, you know, they're nearing retirement age and they're they're just they're it's drudgery to them mm -hmm. and it, it breaks my heart when i hear this but mm -hmm. you know how how would you how would you tell someone from a biblical perspective you know when we understand what you just laid out there and you, you lay out so much more in the book which is so good that we need to teach to our kids how, how would you 
how would you advise them to approach work that, at least in our culture today, would be, you know, we stratify jobs, right? Mm-hmm. Work that would be kind of down here, the, the, the mundane. Uh, you know, you talk about someone who works at Wendy's. I think people think about that. You know, you, a negative thing is uh, you're going to be flipping burgers the rest of your life. Well, what if you are flipping burgers the rest of your life? I mean, that's not... Mm-hmm any less valuable in the eyes of God? How, how do you frame that for folks to see their work through that perspective, even when they're in the mundane? Right. So first of all, it's important to realize that most work is mostly mundane. So if I go speak at a conference, I actually, I love speaking publicly. You probably do too. But how many emails do we get? How long, how hard and long is it to arrange the flight, get in the flight, pack, make sure you have all the notes right, make sure you made, you know, you're, you're giving this talk for the 10th time, uh, but you have to adapt it to this particular audience. And it's not exciting to slightly adapt it for another place. <laughs> you know, a concert, I'm a professor. I spend a lot of time just rewriting my course guide so it can't be misunderstood and it's still misunderstood. I grade papers. Those are not exciting tasks. Um, You know, concert pianists practice scales. Architects, for that matter, to mention them again, I mean, a lot of it's just like making sure the wall is in exactly the right place and the lighting is exactly right. You know, the big idea of how you put a space together is, is quick and the execution is slow. So most jobs are mostly mundane. That's point one. Uh, Point two is, we probably love our neighbors ourselves the most at work. There's a book uh, by a man named uh, Leonard DeCoster called Work, the Meaning of Your Life. And um, he's one of many who say, look, uh, and, and another book by a guy main, uh, named Doug Shurman who uh, writes a book about vocation. And there are two of many who say, we do our best work. We think we do our best work when we're being a volunteer, you know, in soup kitchen or bringing a meal to a neighbor, if you're in the food industry, you do your best work. You're the most resources, the most training, the most capital, the most concentrated effort. When you're, you know, harvesting grain and getting it to China. And that's a big process. And you no volunteer can do that. And so a lot of people say, well, that's drudgery. Well, it is drudgery, but it makes a difference. And it's got a substantial element of drudgery, as does all work. So moving grain to China is mostly not exciting. But moving it better and cheaper and with less waste, that's interesting. Okay, so it's sometimes interesting, sometimes not. But most jobs are mostly drudgery or ordinary or mundane or routine, whatever whatever word you want to use. But that doesn't mean it's without love. It is with love. You're feeding people in China. You're feeding people in New York City. You're, as you proofread a textbook, that's, boy, that's uh, drudgery. As you proofread a textbook, please understand that you're making that book better for everybody who uses it. That's an eighth grade history textbook, and you're trying to get it right. That's an act of love, even if it feels pretty boring. That's, that's the main thing I would say to somebody who feels stuck. So, you have somebody who's, uh, let's say, a finance person. This is one of the first conversations I ever had was with a finance guy. Really got my attention on this 25 years ago, 30 years ago. He said, nothing I do makes any difference. I just approve loans or disapprove loans. And I said, well, yeah, but, and even it's mostly car loans. I said, yes, but sometimes you're saying yes to a car loan to somebody who needs a car to get their first job, to get going in their career. You can change their life, whether you see it or not. And a small business loan, so it's all just cranking through the machinery, and put in the numbers, and I just do what the numbers say. I said, really? Always? You never use your judgment at all? He said, well, of course I use my judgment sometimes. Well, when do you use your judgment? Well, when it's a close call. And when somebody's trying a business venture that may or may not work. Of course, you understand that saying no could help somebody not lose their savings. And you understand that saying no, yes to the right person could lead to two jobs or five or ten. Or, or 300. And you could end up being a really good boss and taking excellent care of a lot of people by creating a dignified workplace. So you didn't do much, but you did something by investing in this person who had a vision, not only to get a job done to make money, but to treat people a certain way in the workplace. 
and and that conversation you had in which that came up was part of why you said yes and and he might say he may say well that's not the way it usually goes usually it's still pretty mundane to which of course we answer yes but sometimes it is and you know a truck driver says i just drive stuff around well yes but are, do you want everybody to drive to minnesota to to get wheat every year and and uh you know get a pickup truck and go to kansas to get a cow i mean our transportation system is a large part of what creates prosperity, wealth, and efficiency in our nation. It counts, even if you don't see it right now. Yeah, we see the importance of all these jobs right now with the supply chain yeah, exactly. issues. You know, I mean, yep. yeah. So, so before we take a break here, let me let me throw this one at you. Let's say you've got, you know, you're at, put yourself in the place of a youth pastor or a parent who has a 15 year old student who's just started a part time job. Right. Working at Wendy's. Mm -hmm. What do you say to them? How do you, you know, how do you give them, how do you coach them into a good perspective on work? I would say first, uh, it's good to earn money. And it is the beginning of becoming an adult. Show up, showing up and paying attention is a, a sort of a baseline, but very valuable skill. One, two, you're at Wendy's. It's food. Food is good. Uh, yeah, there's some, you know, there's salt and fat and to excess in some of it, but some of it's good food. And, you know, they're trying to make it better, generally speaking, uh, more nutritious. So, you know, don't have second thoughts, but don't eat Frosties all day either. That's not good for you. <laughs> um, and number three, ask yourself, what do I enjoy out of this? So there's, uh, there's a book called Range by uh, a writer named David Epstein. And in the middle chapters, he makes the point that one of the best ways to find your calling in life is to move around a little bit and appraise what you're doing. Most people, he says, contrary to popular belief, are actually generalists. They have a variety of skills and they put them together in uh, a way that, you know, maybe they have an engineering degree, but they have picks up some other degrees, skills or degrees along the way. And that allows them to fill the most effective niche by putting two or three skill sets together and each job you have move around a little bit he advocates um each job you have can teach you different things both about what you can do in the world and also what you're good at what you like to do so if you're 15 and you're shoveling snow or you know mowing grass ask yourself what do i like about this what what, what am i good at and not good at and just beginning the beginning the process of self-assessment that's great good well, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back to continue our conversation with Dan Doriani about work. Hey, youth workers, I want to let you know about a podcast resource we've recently launched here at CPYU that's just for you. Our brand new The Word in Youth Ministry podcast is a podcast by youth workers and for youth workers that will help you build and improve your ability to teach the Bible and theology to your students. There is not a more important discipleship task in correctly teaching the truths of God's Word to the kids we've been called to lead. We want them to hear the biblical narrative over and above the constant 24-7 noise of the cultural narrative. So check out the Word in Youth Ministry podcast. You can find it at cpyu.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Dan's book, Work That Makes a Difference, is just been out for about three or four months now, and it is published by P&R Publishing, uh, Work That Makes a Difference, and I, I would recommend highly to parents and to youth workers that you get this. As Dan mentioned, it's actually designed for use in groups, and I think, Dan, when we corresponded uh, before we started to record today, you had mentioned that there's actually some students uh, high school students who have gone through this yeah i've i've uh one of the i try to write for a diverse audience i'll say it that way and it's it's written to you know it's got discussion questions uh it's written to engage uh people who are 25 or 65 or or, or 17 uh for that matter I, when i speak i try to aim at what i call the intelligent 10 or 11 year old and the intelligent 15, 17 year old. Um, I, I did a family conference recently on work partly. Uh, 
and I targeted myself, I targeted my talk at the many, there were a lot of parents and teens there. And I, it was fascinating and, and delightful, honestly, to see how engaged the teenagers and a few college students came to, uh, how, how engaged they were. So everybody should care about work, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And I, I'll tell you what, for those who are listening, if if you choose to get this and read this, and if you're a youth worker, youth pastor, and you and I know some who will do this, you decide to walk some students through this. We would love to hear from you about that experience and and how helpful that's been. I truly believe it will be. You know, I want to go back uh, before we finish up here with some very practical things. I want to go back to the biblical narrative, and and you were talking about you know work as being. Uh, part of the creation, uh, you know, really a creation institution, you know, as, as God lays out in Genesis 1 and 2 for us. And I, I love that because so many think that work, because so much of it is toil, is a post-fall reality. You know, we didn't have to work till this. And I, I, I'll give you a little anecdote. You know, you told a story about being in fourth grade, about the same age. I can still remember a uh, Friday night, my my dad announcing to us. It was in the in in probably late spring. He said, uh, "Boys, tomorrow, uh, don't plan on doing anything with your friends. We're going to go outside and get the flower beds ready, which mm-hmm. involves weeding." And mm-hmm. I can still remember being about ten minutes into weeding, which seemed like ten days, and mm-hmm. sitting there just looking at these weeds, thistles, and otherwise, and going, "Doggone Adam and Eve." You know, if they hadn't have done this, I wouldn't be out here weeding. I'd be playing with my friends. And you so so that's you know, the post fall part of it. You talked about some of that with, with uh, the negative things. But then you then you moved on to how, you know, in this in between time, the now but not yet fully realized kingdom of God, we seek shalom, which is God the way it's supposed to be, and we work to the honor and glory of God. But what about you know that fourth chapter? in the drama of redemption, you know, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Would you say something about work there? Because a lot of people have this notion that, man, everything's done and over and we're just in the clouds. You know, that's what yeah. heaven is, a, a, a horrible, horrible, you know, non-real interpretation of, you know, it's so way off of, of what the new heavens and the new earth will be. Right. Yeah, so one way to look at it is just to remind ourselves that if God created work, if it created a world that needed work, then when all before the fall, then when the world is fully restored and the new heavens come down and we live with glorified bodies, not, uh, you know, cloud harp, angel floating heaven, which terrified me when I first heard about it when I was eight or nine years old. I thought, what about baseball? Yeah, why would I want to go there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then, you know, you, you read about the resurrection of the body and and uh, ongoing blessed activity throughout uh, eternity, then that's that just feels so much better. But one thing to do is to uh, is to trace it back to creation and say, well, look, if this activity was good in the beginning, it's probably still good. Right. And we won't cr- raise food out of need, but there's no reason to believe we won't raise food, eat food, prepare food. After all, there's a wedding feast of the lamb, which every time I've been to a feast, it involved eating. And it's been a long Christian tradition to understand that food is a gift of God. And we, you know, even, you know, even the most world denying Christians said, look, food is a gift, not just for the body, but also for conviviality and joy. You know, Jesus gave us the sacrament of the Lord's supper, right? So, so food is good, and we should expect to be making and eating food for all eternity. Not that we'll get hungry and starve. How that works out, I don't know. Um, a lot of people get hung up on the fact that that so many jobs are uh, curative or ameliorative. So, you know, there will be no undertakers, no people, no surgeons, no soldiers. And, that, and no policemen. So actually, there might be policemen in the new heavens and new earth, and they'd be giving people directions as we drive around in whatever vehicle we have and we get lost, you know. The Bible never says we'll be omniscient. So, you know, we may be need in, in need of directions from uh, some kind of civil officers, traffic officers, you might call them. So that's obviously speculative, you know, with making music and maybe playing sports and working, doing woodworking and who knows what we'll be doing? All the negative jobs that only cure evil will be gone. But even there, it doesn't allow us to be 
negative toward curative jobs, right? So, you know, all Jesus did was fix a problem, the problem of evil, and he healed people. So let's not look down upon healing, the healing arts, or the um, rest restorative jobs, but they will be gone. We won't have, you know, trauma counselors in the new creation, for example, and we won't have first responders after accidents. So what we will do, we don't know, but I just keep coming back. If Jesus worked with his hands longer than he was working as redeemer, then working with the hands is good. And uh, if God says we'll have a feast, then there'll be food preparers somehow or other. And we may even be washing dishes with, you know, uh, there may be grease on the dishes, but we won't mind. Yeah. Because it'll be a time to reflect on the meal we just had. Yeah. Chris, Chris will be cleaning the tables and bringing the dishes to me and I'll be washing the pots. You know, those well, first I, jobs. I, I walked. Yeah. I washed pots as well. That yeah. <laughs> was a job I guess all three of us had at one point. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I, I'm thinking about that in other jobs. I'll just throw this in that, you know, I graduated from Geneva, and I went to work for the Coalition for Christian Outreach, but I had about mm -hmm. a month and a half interim mm -hmm. between graduation and when uh, started. And even as a 21, 22-year-old, you know, I go home before I leave for training with a CCO and, and my dad and mom say to me, you know, you're not going to be laying around for a month and a half here. This is not a vacation. Mm -hmm. You know and I'm thinking? Oh man. And they said, you know, find a part-time job. I was fine with that. They didn't have to force mm -hmm. me to do that. And I got a job at a large retirement community outside of uh, Philadelphia. And I, I worked the dishwasher for the meals for the, you know, older folks. And I, and I think, you know, what I remember about that was I knew it wasn't permanent. Right. But I knew I could be joyful at my job. Mm -hmm. and, um, and and I owe a lot of that, you know, to the training I received, not only growing up in the home, but at Geneva as well. And, of course, my, my youth pastors instilled that to me, you know, just with Christian yes. nurture. So yeah. let, let's bring this around. I mean, be, oh, Can man. I just affirm yeah, yeah. that for one second? Yeah. Um, one reason why washing dishes, which I also did, is fun is because you get something done. Uh, you know, there's... I worked in a yeah. big place that had thousands of dishes in a day and here they all come. It's the rush and you get it done. Yeah. And uh, there's a satisfaction in washing all those dishes and now they're put away and we're ready for the next day. Um, one of the things we miss today, of course, so much work is, is uh, fragmented and we don't get to see, you know, if you're building a house or a building, you have this tiny sliver of the job. That's one reason why we get frustrated. We don't yeah. See the results. Yeah. I, I unloaded trucks after college before my first job, and I loved it. It's a very similar issue. There was sol problem solving. Uh, where do you put all this stuff when three trucks come in at once? And it's also, okay, several tons of food came in, and uh, you got to get it off and, and all in the right spot, in, in the right cooler or freezer. And, and a lot of manual work, there's um, the book, um, oh, come on, I can't say the name of the book. It's about shop classes, soul craft. I can't remember the title of the book, uh, the author, I mean, but, you know, a lot of so-called manual labor is very thoughtful. There's a lot of skill involved and uh, unloading trucks or fixing cars is actually very complex and beautiful work. Yeah. Which yeah. may be a segue to your last question. Yeah. I yeah. Well, well, I, I'll just say this, you know, it's funny because being in ministry and I hear this from a lot of folks in ministry, what you described as sort of unfinished business, loose mm -hmm. ends. That's what right. we deal with all the time with people and the work's never done. And I walk through the grocery store and I see the order on the shelves mm -hmm. and I see these folks in there you know, adjusting the cans. I'm going, I could do that. I would love to do that, you know, to work overnight. You know, Christmas is coming. And of course, everything's, you know, everybody's hiring seasonally. And I see these things, you know, work overnight stocking shelves. And I could that do that. That was a job I held at one yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Like mm -hmm. I could do that. And this is why I love cutting grass, you know, my yes. own lawn. You know, there's, and I'm making lines and there's a start, there's a finish. And I just. Yep. You know, and I'm able to think it's just a beautiful, wonderful thing. So, uh, yeah, if those who are listening, m maybe you you feel the same way. And I often, you know, I'm, I'm at Home Depot or Lowe's because I love to build things. And and I'm going, I could work here. I, I would mm -hmm. love this. I could. This is just great, you know, looking around. So so here's what I want to end with. You know, give us a final word. Um, I'd like you to speak to parents. You're a parent. You're a grandparent. 
you know, I'm a parent, I'm a grandparent. What, what, what would you say to parents and grandparents about, you know, you know, the, the short version of here's, here's where you need to start or, or what you need to say to your kids and your grandkids about, about work from a Christian perspective. And then also, uh, and there might be overlap here. So the secondary audience would be youth workers. You know, they're discipling, they're discipling kids alongside of parents. So give us some practical suggestions. And, and I'll, I'll start with get Dan's book, Work That Makes a Difference, and read it, because that's going to give you a lot right there. But go ahead, Dan. You're very kind. Thanks. So the first thing I would say is work is good, and you just say it, and you need to reflect it. So that means if you're cooking, take pleasure in the cooking. You know, this is work, but we've put together a good meal. Um, you know, if you're putting it together, I don't know, flower garden, which you've alluded to a couple times, uh, take, let it be clear that there's pleasure in this. Don't disparage work as you work. If you're a parent, grandparent, or a youth worker, work is good. Washing cars is good. It's fun. You may lose track of that, but then get a couple four-year-olds and eight-year-olds helping you wash the car, and all of a sudden you realize washing cars is, is awesome. It's so much fun. And just keep the positive spirit that this is part of God's good gift. Yes, it's fraught with sin and, and uh, disorder. That's one. So say it and live it is, is point one. Uh, point two, please don't give in to the sacred secular split. Oh, I wanted to talk it's, about that, yeah. Or it's derivative, uh, which is intellectual work is better than physical work. So first of all, it, you're not better if you're a pastor, youth worker, seminary professor, or Christian counselor than somebody who's farming and raising food that feeds people or getting that food from the farm to the table in all the many steps of course that transpire between them you're loving your neighbor you're serving god food clothing shelter if we have these we'll be content paul says which means it's good to bring food clothing shelter food and covering to people it's good to give medical care we don't we don't apologize for it we're grateful we get to do it and we talk about it praising god i would say adults talk about your work praise god what happened at work today uh, a health care provider tell a story of how somebody found their way to health their problem is diagnosed we got a path for them uh, to get better and we're going to hope that they take that path through their exercises or you know lose weight or take a medicine or whatever it is that they need to do and uh, come home with happy stories, not sad, miserable, angry stories. And, and see that all, all honest work is good work. Not all jobs that are legal are honest. But, but every job that is honest, meaning producing good, doing good to, to our neighbors and making this world a better place, bringing justice, love, promoting the common good, those are all beautiful and if you're called to be a pastor, praise God. But if you're called to be an engineer, praise God, too. It's One's not better than the other. You know, the absurd thing, of course, is this sort of hierarchy. And if you go far enough, so I'm in ministry because I teach at a seminary. But, of course, I'm not as noble as a pat. And you're not, sorry, Well, you run a ministry. You, you don't get your hands dirty with the kids. You, you give out advice and get on your plane or in your car and take off. So the person on the ground, the pastor, youth worker, is actually more noble than we are. Yep. But then the missionary is more noble than that because they're doing it all in a foreign language and a foreign culture. So they're better than we are. But then a missionary who's in a third world country is more noble than one who's in, you know, one of the prosperous areas of Europe or Asia because they're also deprived. <clears throat> and then, you know, at the top, the pinnacle of the entire universe is the person who works in a, you know, snake infested tree hut in, you know, 400 miles up the river in Mali. And, and that's the best person who ever lived. Well, just to say it reveals the absurdity of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been, reading, I've been reading a book about heaven uh, last night. A friend of mine sent me the book. And, you know, it just reminded me again that, you know, recreation, new heavens, new earth is about enjoying God. And who enjoys God the most? It may be that person who washed dishes their whole life but prayed. And loved their neighbor, you know, and just brought some light to their workplace. 
which doesn't mean they're more important than the CEO who runs the whole enterprise of this restaurant. Because a CEO has strategic weight that nobody else has to make work better for a lot of people. And we have to seize that. If you're in a leadership position, make use of it because you can, you can create an environment that's better for many people. On the other hand, the person who's washing dishes 40 years in a row or you know, doing maintenance work 40 years in a row uh, may actually shed more of God's love in their immediate neighborhood than anybody else around. And partly because their work doesn't demand that much intellectually and they can focus on being kind. And they may actually know more about God and his ways than anybody else in the whole organization. Mm. So we want to dignify all work. That's the that's the basic point I'm making. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been good. I I, I love this. And uh, Chris, do you want to mention something quickly about how folks can access all the resources that Dan happened to mention, along with his book and the Center for uh, the the Center for Faith and Work in St. Louis. Yep, all the links in books and stuff that Dan has mentioned will be on our episodes notes page on our website at cpyu.org. Great, great, thank you, Dan. Thanks so much. It's so good. I get to see you. The listeners don't. I'm looking at you over Zoom here, and uh, it's been a long time since I've seen pictures of you. And I think we've <laughs> run into each other a couple of times since college. Tiny but- bit. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's great to to chat with you, and I and I, I'm so grateful for uh, not only your willingness to join us, but you know the things that you've the the things that you've immersed yourself in over the years, and uh, the wisdom. I guess I guess we're of that age now, right? Uh, where hopefully we have some wisdom to impart. I know you were imparting it a long time ago, but I'm grateful for you sharing uh, that with us here on on the podcast. So thanks for joining us. It's good to be with you and to work with you, Walt. Yeah. And uh, everyone who's listening, I'll remind you, along with checking out the episode notes, as Chris said, you know, go ahead and subscribe to the podcast, share it with friends, leave a good review. That's always helpful for us. Yeah, that's, that's the normal shtick you hear from people these days at the end of a podcast. But the, it is helpful. So uh, word of mouth is crucial. So thanks so much for joining us. And we'll catch you on the next episode of Youth Culture Matters. Thanks for joining us for Youth Culture Matters, a podcast from the Center for Parent Youth Understanding. If you'd like to learn more about today's youth culture, visit our website at cpyu.org. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, email us at podcast at cpyu.org.